So our next speaker, Kasim Kassam, is a philosopher from the University of Warwick, author of the book Self-Knowledge for Humans, which I recommend. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the relationship between three things, uh, diagnostic error, self-confidence, in particular overconfidence, and self-knowledge. Um, I feel a bit diffident talking about diagnostic error to an audience, some of whom are presumably doctors and I'm not. But, uh, so with apologies to those of you who are doctors. Um, so diagnostic error then um, is uh, any mistake or failure in the diagnostic process leading to a misdiagnosis um, or a uh, delayed diagno diagnosis. Um, so one thing that comes through from the literature is that uh, diagnostic error rates uh, uh, remain quite high despite advances in medical technology. Um, so there are different estimates of uh, diagnostic error rates uh, in, in different places, um, but there's a famous um, article uh, by um, Schiff which estimates an error rate of somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Uh, and there are, there are other papers that suggest um, um, higher, higher error rates than that. So uh, an obvious question then is, is, is how do we explain um, diagnostic error? Now, no doubt, there are lots of different explanations. I think it would be foolish to suppose that there's one explanation. However, what I want to do here is to focus on one, one hypothesis that's been advanced in the literature. In, in, a, in a, a paper published in 2008 by uh, Berner and Graeber. So they put forward a hypothesis which I'm, which I'm just calling the overconfidence hypothesis. And the hypothesis says very simply that physician overconfidence is a major factor contributing to diagnostic error. Okay, and there's a definition of um, overconfidence on the handout. Um, on the handout too. Um, so it's basically the idea that um, one's sense of one's own diagnostic accuracy is much higher than actual accuracy. That's how overconfidence is defined uh, by Berner and Graeber. And they, they relate overconfidence in their sense to things like complacency and arrogance. So, so that's, their, that's their idea. Now, now there are lots of questions about the overconfidence hypothesis. So let me just start with a couple which I'm not actually going to talk about at any length here, but just, just for completeness, I'll just mention them. I mean, one question, which is the main, in a way the basic question is, is this hypothesis actually correct? And, and, and that's, that, that's an empirical question, um, and um, it's actually quite a hard question to, to, uh, to find, uh, to, to answer. Um, on the basis of empirical research, but my understanding is that there's, some, there's at least some evidence in support of the overconfidence hypothesis. I mean, another issue which I'm not going to go into in any detail, but I'll mention because I think it connects with the last, the last talk is this, which is supposing you think that overconfidence is a cause of diagnostic error, you then need to identify what the mechanism is. What, how do you get from overconfidence to diagnostic error? What's the causal pathway leading from one thing to the other thing? Now, again, there are lots of different proposals here. So one suggestion is that uh, physician overconfidence um, has, um, among its consequences, non-compliance with clinical guidelines. And so the physician thinks he or she knows best. They don't comply with clinical guidelines, and this can, can result in diagnostic error. So that's one causal pathway from overconfidence to diagnostic error. Another causal pathway that's been proposed is that overconfidence can lead physicians uh, not to request diagnostic tests, additional diagnostic tests, which they should be asking for, and that's another, another source of um, diagnostic error. So, the, so these are various ways of filling in the gap, right? uh, the, the causal story. Uh, relating overconfidence to, 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 to diagnostic error, and there's a lot to be said about all of that, but I'm not going to go into that uh, today. What I'm interested in today, given the topic of this conference, is of course, is, is ultimately, what's the role of self-knowledge? What's the role of self-knowledge in addressing 
diagnostic error that's caused by overconfidence. Um, and in order, to, in order to, to, to look at what role self-knowledge might play uh, in, in this context, we need to understand more clearly what kind of explanation the over overconfidence hypothesis is offering. Okay, so, so when it said overconfidence causes diagnostic error, what kind of explanation is that? And that depends in turn on how we understand the notion of overconfidence. Okay, so I now want to say a bit more about overconfidence and about the, um, uh, the overconfidence hypothesis. So diagnostic errors, and indeed medical errors, are um, examples of the more general phenomenon of human error. Okay, so it's not just in the medical context that we talk about errors, but in all sorts of different contexts. So what I want to propose is, is, is a taxonomy of different types of explanation of error. Okay, so here's, here's, my, here's my taxonomy. Um, so one type of explanation of error is what I call a personal explanation. Okay, so personal explanations, this is 4A on the handout, personal, personal explanations attribute error to the personal qualities of individuals or groups of individuals. Okay, so qualities like, for example, carelessness and ignorance are personal qualities which are sometimes used to explain error. Okay, so that's a person. So, 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 I mean, personal explanations get very personal, right? I mean, it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's really blaming an individual for their failings. Okay, so that's one type of explanation of, of, of error. Then there are what I call sub-personal explanations of error. Now, sub-personal explanations of error attribute error to the automatic, involuntary, and largely unconscious operation of hardwired cognitive mechanisms or biases. Okay, so for those, those of you who've read this very famous book by Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, okay, so, so the whole Kahneman story is, 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 is that um, um, there are these rules of thumb which we employ in our thinking, which he calls heuristics, and these rules of thumb sometimes generate systematic errors, which he calls biases. Okay? And the point about these sorts of biases, for example, confirmation bias, is that we aren't aware of them. Right? We aren't aware of thinking in these ways. We aren't aware of our own biases. They're biases that operate um, at, at, a, at a kind of uh, a subconscious level. They just work within our, within our psychologies in, a, in an automatic way. Okay, so that's a, that's a subpersonal explanation of, 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 of error. It's an explanation of error not by reference to the personal qualities of individuals, but rather by reference to just the way that human cognitive mechanisms operate. A different kind of explanation of error is a situational explanation. Okay, so situational explanations explain error by reference to situational factors such as um, overwork or time pressure or fatigue. Okay, so the thought is when you explain an error in situational terms, it's not about the personal qualities of the individual. It's not about, it's not about their implicit biases or heuristics. It's just about simple things like they were very tired or they were very stressed or they were very overworked. Okay, so that's a situational explanation of error. And lastly, there are what I call systemic explanations of error. Okay, so systemic explanations of error are explanations of error that don't explain error by talking about characteristics of the individual. Rather, they're explanations that, that focus on characteristics of the system or the organization or the institution within which individuals work. Okay, so... Um, so, so, so these are explanations which say that, well, you know, these mistakes were made because there was something wrong with a system, not because there was something wrong with the individual. Okay, so that's a taxonomy of four types of explanation of error. There's a guy called James Reason who writes a lot about human error, and he has an article in the BMJ where he, um, he, he focuses specifically on the contrast between person and system explanations. Okay, and his idea is that, is that we should avoid person explanations and focus on system explanations. Okay. What I'm proposing is a kind of more 
slightly more complex taxonomy, four different types of explanation of error. Okay, so let's go back to um, the first type, personal explanation. Okay, now I talked about um, um, carelessness and ignorance as two examples of factors that might figure in a personal explanation. Now these are examples of what philosophers call epistemic vices or alternatively intellectual vices. Okay, so let me just try and explain this notion of an epistemic vice. I'm going to just use the label epistemic vice here. So epistemic vices are character traits or attitudes or thinking styles that get in the way of knowledge or effective practice. Okay, so let me get that to you again. So ep epistemic vices are character traits, attitudes, or thinking styles that get in the way of knowledge or effective practice. Okay, so let me give you some examples of, of, of epistemic vices. Okay, so here's a, here's a, here's a kind of list. Close-mindedness, dogmatism, gullibility, prejudice, carelessness. Okay, you, you, you can add to that list. Okay, so, so the thought is, these are epistemic vices in the sense that they are, um, they are, they are, either, they are either character traits, like close-mindedness, or their attitudes, like prejudice, or their thinking styles, like perhaps wishful thinking, which, which have a negative effect on our ability to um, acquire and retain and transmit knowledge. And they also have a negative effect on various kinds of professional practice. What about the label um, vice? Why, why use the label vice? Now, of course, vice has all sorts of connotations, you know, immorality and so on, which, 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 which are not relevant in the present context. Vice here just means something like um, um, a defect. That's all it, that's all it means. And, but, but the point of using the label vice is to imply a degree of blameworthiness. Okay, so, so, to, so to talk about, for example, someone as careless or close-minded right, is not just to identify their epistemic vices, but of course it's implicitly to criticize them for being that way. Okay, so so vice, vice implies blame, right, and that's why the, the label epistemic vice seems, um, seems, seems appropriate. Okay, and, and I think it's a very interesting fact that, that, that a lot of our explanations a lot of our psychological explanations are actually vice explanations. Okay, so if you, I mean, if you think about, for example, um, people who have extreme fundamentalist views, lot, lot, you, you, the question, well, why do they, how can they believe those things? So one type of explanation that's often given is, well, you know, they're close-minded or dogmatic or whatever it is. Okay, so, so vice explanations are, are, are figure in a lot of ordinary psychological, um, psychological explanation. Okay, so let's go back to the, um, to the overconfidence hypothesis. Okay, so what kind of explanation is the overconfidence hypothesis offering of diagnostic error? Well, on the one hand, you might think, look, surely what it's offering us is a personal explanation of error. It's offering us a personal explanation because it's explaining error, diagnostic error, by reference to things like overconfidence, arrogance, and complacency. And what are those if they aren't epistemic vices? Okay, so that's one, that's one way of reading the overconfidence hypothesis. Right? It's, it's actually explaining diagnostic error by reference to certain personal qualities of those physicians who commit those errors. And those personal qualities are what I'm calling calling epistemic vices. Okay, so that, that's one way of reading the, um, uh, the overconfidence hypothesis. It's a very, it's a very, it's a very effectively a kind of very personal critique right, of those who commit these errors. Okay, now there's another way of reading the overconfidence hypothesis hypothesis, which I think is closer to what the people in the medical literature have in mind. 
This alternative way of reading it is as offering not a personal explanation of error, but a subpersonal explanation of error. Okay, and the reason I say that is, is this, that, that, that in, the, in the literature on the overconfidence hypothesis, overconfidence is very often presented not as a kind of character defect, it's presented rather as a subpersonal cognitive bias. Okay, so, so, so in fact, people who write in this tradition often describe some, they, they often talk about something which they call the overconfidence bias. So, so the thought here is this, that overconfidence is a kind of universal human characteristic, something to, to, which, we're all, to which we're all prone to varying degrees. Um, it's something that, um, in a way, we can't really help, um, and um, it, 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 le it leads us um, to have excessive degrees of confidence in our own, um, in our own diagnostic skills. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of subpersonal, um, that's the subpersonal interpretation. So again, um, if, you look at, if you look at Kahneman's work, so Kahneman says somewhere in Thinking Fast and Slow that overconfidence is endemic in the medical profession. I don't know if that's true or not, but he certainly claims that. And he sees, he sees this overconfidence that he thinks is endemic in the medical profession as, as, a, as, as a kind of cognitive bias, as a reflection of the way in which the human mind works. So, so there's nothing personal about this. It's just this is just how we, we, we we're, we, we're sort of hardwired to be overconfident on this interpretation. Um, okay, now there's a third way of reading the overconfidence hypothesis, which is to read it actually not as either personal or as subpersonal, but in fact to interpret it as a kind of systemic explanation of error. Okay, so let me explain what I, what I mean by that. So you might, you might think that um, certain character traits are selected for in medical recruitment and medical training. Okay. Uh, I mean, so, so it, it, this, is a, this is a kind of interesting suggestion that's been put forward by Trish Greenholsch in a, in a, in a, in a recent, recent discussion of what she calls professional vices. Okay, so she asked the question, what are, what are the vices that are characteristic of uh, uh, of, of medical practitioners. And of course, you could ask the same question about philosophers, right? What are the professional vices of professional philosophers? And that, I mean, we'd be here all day if we talked about those. But mm -hmm. um, so her suggestion is that, you know, if you think of overconfidence as a vice, her, her suggestion is that, look, it's not right to think of it as a kind of personal vice. It's more appropriate to think of it as a professional vice, as something that is, that is um, 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 Selected for when, when you when you pick students to go into into medical school, and that's then um, that's then as it were developed and promoted, particularly in certain specialisms. Okay, so so you might you might think that you, perhaps spe some specialisms like surgery uh, promote it more than other specialisms like you know radiology. Um, uh, so, so the suggestion is that is that although it's okay to talk about you know vices. It, uh, uh, it, it's not okay to think of them as personal characteristics. It's more appropriate to think of them as, 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 as professional vices. Okay, so I've, I've offered three different interpretations of the overconfidence um, hypothesis. Okay, so what, what should we actually think about this hypothesis? Okay, well, my suggestion is that actually there's something right about all of those three interpretations. I think that the overconfidence hypothesis offers an explanation that is personal, subpersonal, and also systemic. It's personal because overconfidence, arrogance, and complacency are indeed personal qualities. And that seems to be that seems to be right. They are indeed personal um, qualities of some, not all, physicians, and they may be more prevalent in some specialisms than others. Okay, when I say that they're personal qualities, what I mean is that they're patterns of thoughts, feelings, desires, and action, that different people have these qualities to varying degrees, and that they are part of the agent that can be morally evaluated. So it, it doesn't seem to me that you can, you, you can think of explanations that talk about arrogance and complacency as having no personal dimension. I mean, of course, of course these, are personal, these are personal qualities if they exist at all. 
On the other hand, although I think these are personal qualities, they are caused in part by cognitive biases of various kinds. And some of these cognitive biases are indeed subpersonal. So I'm not very keen on the idea of overconfidence as a bias, but I think there are more basic biases in which overconfidence is, is, um, is grounded. Um, as I say, if you want to know more about the whole biases um, a, a, approach, the, the whole idea of a cognitive bias, I would rec highly recommend Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which has a lot more to say about, uh, say, say about all this. Okay, so the thought is, although we have personal qualities of various kinds, our personal qualities have some, have some basis in our underlying cognitive mechanism, the way, the way that our minds work. As for the uh, systemic uh, interpretation, I think it's also, I think, I think it's also true that, that, uh, that overconfidence is indeed a, um, a systemic um, a systemic epistemic vice, one that is in some sense built into the culture of medicine or selected for by medical training and recruitment. So I think there's an element of truth uh, of, in all three interpretations of the overconfidence um, hypothesis. Now, of course, once you think of the overconfidence hypothesis in these, in these different ways, you then face the basic question, to what extent are people blameworthy for diagnostic errors that are due to overconfidence? So if you think that people make mistakes, these mistakes are the result of, of overconfidence, are they blameworthy for these mistakes? Now that raises uh, uh, very large philosophical questions which I don't want to um, get, get drawn into in, in, in too much detail, but let me just kind of throw out w w what I think is a very basic issue here. I think it's very natural to think that we're only blameworthy for um, uh, factors over which we have control. That seems to be a, an intuition about blameworthiness that lots of people have. Now, if you have that intuition, then a the natural question is, well, look, if you attribute diagnostic errors to epistemic vices, are people blameworthy for their epistemic vices? Are they blameworthy for their own epistemic character traits? Well, that's just a really good question, right? which, I, which, which I, I'm just going to leave open for, 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 uh, for, for the moment. Um, if diagnostic errors are due to systemic factors or subpersonal factors, do we want to say that people are blameworthy for them? It's not obvious that they are. It's not obvious that we have the kind of control over our cognitive biases or over the systems within which we work. We don't have the kind of control that's required for blameworthiness. So I think there are some large questions here which, which, which I'm just, I, I, I just mentioned, the questions that we might want to, want to think about further. Um, and, and I think it's worth saying that, that people, who fo who, who people like uh, um, James Reason, who focus very much on the systemic explanations of error, part of the point of systemic explanations is to get away from the idea of blame. Okay, so the thought is, it, I mean, people like that think it's just not helpful, it's not constructive, and it's not fair right, to, to go around blaming people for mistakes that have much more to do with the systems in, in, within which they work than with, with them as individuals. Okay, so, so there's a very interesting um, debate here. And I think, I think the, underlying issue, the underlying philosophical issue is, is the issue of control. Uh, can you be blameworthy for what is not within your own control? All right, so now I want to turn to the issue of self-knowledge. So supposing you, supposing you buy the story I've been telling so far. Okay, so supposing you think, okay, so diagnostic error is more or less prevalent in medicine. And you think there's something to this idea that a major cause of diagnostic error is overconfidence. Right? Supposing you buy all that. What self-knowledge got to do with this? So here's a suggestion that, 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 that's floating around in the literature. It's not, it's not been made, as far as I know, particularly uh, articulate, but I think, it's, I think it's there. The suggestion is something like this. That if you want to really tackle diagnostic error, then 
An effective way of doing that, an effective way of doing that, is, is to make people, particularly physicians, aware of their own diagnostic errors and aware of the factors that cause those errors, including factors about their own psychologies. Okay, so, 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 that, so the picture is something like this, right? So, so you have this blithely overconfident physician who goes about his or her business without being aware of the mistakes that they're making or having any understanding of why they're making these mistakes. Okay, so the self-confidence strategy is to say, well, the first thing you need to do, sorry, the self-knowledge strategy is to say, the first thing you need to do is to make them aware of the extent of their errors. Okay, so that's a certain kind of knowledge which, 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 uh, which they need to have. Um, but also to make them aware of why it is that they're making these mistakes, right? to make them aware of, for example, their own overconfidence, to make them aware of the risks that being overconfident poses right, to their professional practice. So, so, so the theory is that if you do that, the net result will be to induce in these physicians a degree of humility which they didn't previously have. And this humility is then going to improve, um, um, uh, improve their practice, is going to reduce the level of diagnostic error. So that's, a th so, so that's the theory. Okay, so the theory is by making physicians more self-aware, right, by, by, by providing physicians with, with greater knowledge and indeed self-knowledge, you're going to um, be able to, at least to some extent, tackle the problem of overconfidence. So that's what I call on the handout self-knowledge in theory. Well, that's self-knowledge in theory, but what about self-knowledge in practice? It, 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 in practice, is that in fact going to be a good way to tackle the problem of, um, of overconfidence? Well, I have some doubts about that, and I want to end by um, um, spelling out some of, my, some of my doubts about this. So here's the first worry. Essentially, what's being suggested is that uh, overconfident individuals, overconfident physicians, need to be encouraged to engage in a kind of epistemic self-diagnosis. They, they need to be encouraged to know themselves. They need to be encouraged to know their own, um, to, um, to know their own epistemic vices. But of course, if you're dealing with someone who is complacent and overconfident, then they might not be motivated to engage in this kind of self-diagnosis. Right? I mean, the more, over, the, the more confident you are in, in, in your own practice, the less likely you, you are to think that you're the kind of person who needs to engage in serious self-examination. Right? So, I mean, of course, the standard thing that, people, that do doctors say about diagnostic error is that, they, is that, well, of course, diagnostic error is a problem, and, uh, and indeed, their colleagues really need to get their act together. Right? Uh, uh, but it, it, it's, it's rare for them to think that they need to get their acts together or that they need to, they need to engage in, um, in, in the kind of self-diagnosis that's being recommended. Um, okay, so so that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's, uh, that's the first worry. The second worry related to this is the following. That the problem is supposed to be the existence of these epistemic vices that cause diagnostic error, right? vices like, over, like, like, like overconfidence, arrogance, and complacency. That's the problem. Okay? The solution is supposed to be self-knowledge. Now, how do you get self-knowledge? Well, you get self-knowledge by critical self-examination, right? by, 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 by reflecting on, on yourself and reflecting on your practice. But of course, if you have these epistemic vices, they're just as likely to affect your self-examination self -examin as they are to affect everything else that you do. Okay, so, so it, there's, a, there's a, I think, a helpful notion here which, which I want to introduce, which is the notion of a stealthy vice, a stealthy vice. Okay, so a stealthy vice is an epistemic vice, an epistemic vice that, um, evades detection by the person who has it. That's a stealthy vice. Okay, so let me give you some examples of what I have in mind here. So take carelessness. 
Now, carelessness, I think, is a non-stealthy vice. The fact that you are careless does not prevent you from knowing that you're careless. Right? I, mean, the, I mean, carelessness, it isn't in the nature of carelessness to make it hard for you to know that you're careless. Okay? But now think about close-mindedness. Close-mindedness is an example of a stealthy vice. So the fact that you're close-minded is very likely to make it difficult for you to recognize that you're close-minded. Okay, so so close-mindedness is the kind of paradigm epistemic vice that, 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 that erects a barrier around itself. Right? So it's in the nature of close-mindedness to make it hard for people who are close-minded to recognize that they're close-minded. I mean, that's why the most close-minded people that you know go around saying, I'm very open-minded, I am. Right? So, 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 so that's an example of a stealthy vice. Okay, so, uh, uh, an interesting question, I think, is, is when you look at vices like overconfidence, arrogance, and complacency, are they stealthy or non-stealthy? Okay, so, so, so one worry, I mean, one worry is that, is that, is that if you imagine... Um, um, a, a, a super confident individual right, who has complete faith in their own abilities, not only as doctors but in other, in other regards. I mean, are they likely to be able to recognize their own failings? Are they likely to be able to recognize that they are in fact overconfident? Well, it's not obvious that they will be. Right? It's not obvious that they will be because um, um, the, their, their overconfidence, that very vice, might prevent them from recognizing that they are overconfident. They might think, well, that's nothing to do with overconfidence. Right? Um, so, so that's another problem with the self-knowledge. Um, that's, that's another problem with the, with the self-knowledge strategy. Um, so, the, so the suggestion is that, is that overconfidence and complacency are stealthy vices. They impede their own detection by self-diagnosis. And, uh, and this is something that, that's mentioned in one of the... One of the, one of the um, uh, papers I discuss. So on the handout 10, there's a quotation from um, a guy called Croscory, who writes a lot about this subject, uh, where he, he points out that clinicians' overconfidence in their own judgments may be one of the most powerful factors preventing debiasing, by which he means one of the most powerful factors preventing them from becoming less overconfident. Right, so that's a classic example of what I'm calling a stealthy vice. Okay. Um, so, 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 so that's one problem with the self-knowledge strategy. Right? The self-knowledge strategy is problematic because the types of self-knowledge that you would need to have in order to become less epistemically vicious are precisely the types of self-knowledge which you'll find very difficult to obtain given that you are epistemically vicious. Right? Um, that's one problem. The other problem with the self-knowledge strategy is this. Knowledge, even self-knowledge, isn't enough. It, it isn't enough to know your own failings. Even if you know your own failings, of course, um, that's not going to uh, re result in any change unless you're motivated to improve. And self-knowledge is no guarantee of self-improvement. I mean, so if you imagine someone who's really complacent, I mean, among the things about which they might be complacent is the fact that they're complacent. So, so, so it's not, I mean, the mere fact that you can bring somebody to recognize that they, they have all these failings is not in itself going to be sufficient to get them to do anything, to get them to do anything about it. So self-knowledge um, may be a start, but it's certainly not going to be sufficient to bring about, um, about self-improvement. Okay, so... Um, Um, that, that's what I call, right at the end, on the last page of the handout, the paradox of self-knowledge. Um, so the more that self-knowledge is necessary, the less it's possible. That's, that, that, that's, that's, one, that's, one part of the, that's one part of the paradox. And of course, that's why you might think, in the end, it's more productive to focus on um, situational and systemic factors than personal factors. Okay, so let me just summarize, um, let me just summarize um, what, what, I, what I've been saying. Okay, so th th I've been looking at the overconfidence hypothesis and different explanations of the overconfidence hypothesis. I've really focused on personal readings of that hypothesis, readings of the hypothesis on which overconfidence, arrogance, and complacency are personal qualities that causally explain some diagnostic error. Okay. Uh, uh, and I've looked at whether self-knowledge 
is, if that's the disease, whether self-knowledge is the cure. And what I've been suggesting is that um, it may well not be. Okay. So that's it. Right. Thank you for seeing questions. So I think that was really useful. Um, a, a, a few um, a question first. When you say overconfidence, with regard to to what actually? With regard to the physician. Let's say let, to, to focus less on the sort of physicians in medicine. Which I think is a particular case. Are we talking about the physician's ability to, to um, overconfidence in their ability to understand, or is it? Um, uh, in the ability for the world, in this case the body, to yield its secrets, so to speak. Um, I think we, overconfidence may be something that we, um, that's a narrative, of course, and also instances of self-deception. We talked about it on the part of patients before. I think it's also related to the need we all have for certainty. And it's possible that our medical culture in particular is afflicted with this need for certainty. Whereas, of course, we all know that skepticism has to always be present. So one wonders, maybe an injection of skepticism within the medical culture would be what would start the cure and systemic cure, which then would actually end up undercutting cases of personal confidence. Yeah, th thanks, thanks very much. So on, on the first thing about, about uh, um, overconfidence, so, so the, way, the way these studies work is that, is that in the, sim in the simplest studies, physicians are presented with a range of cases. So these are often sort of fi um, made up cases of conditions um, ranging from very simple to very complex. Okay? And, 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 and they're then asked to, 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 to propose a diagnosis based on the descriptions that they're provided with. Uh, and they're then asked to rate their own diagnoses um, for level of certainty. Okay? So it's from zero, very very uncertain to 10, very, very certain. Um, so in some of these studies, what they found was that, was that um, so in the simple cases, cases where the condition is quite, quite, quite simple, in those cases, the objective level of diagnostic accuracy is quite high. Whereas in the complex, in the difficult cases, the objective level of diagnostic accuracy is quite low. But what they found was that the physician's rating of their own confidence in their judgments didn't vary at all. Right, so they were equally, they, so they had a high level of confidence in their own diagnoses, even in the case of the complex cases. They were aware of the difference in complexity. Well, well so they, they were, I mean, they're presented, with, they're presented with the cases. They weren't presented as, this is a difficult case, this is a simple case. They were just presented with the cases. But the cases were constructed so that two of them were simple, two of them were very complicated. So even in a case where there was a, in the difficult cases where the, the, the level of ac diagnostic accuracy among the 130 physicians, the actual level of accuracy was about 43%. Right? Um, the, the level of confidence in their own diagnostic accuracy was very high, as high in those cases as in, as in the simple. In, so, so, so overconfidence is, is, is then defined as sort of miscalibration Right, between your sub subjective sense of whether you're getting it right or not and the actual level of accuracy. Now, on the second thing that you said, I, I, I think that's ab absolutely right and, and, and really fundamental, which is th this, whole, th this whole business about the, ro the, role of, the role of certainty and doubt uh, uh, in, 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 in medical culture. Um, and, and I think there are, two, there are kind of two things you might say about that. I mean, one thing that you, you might say is that, is that it's... It, it, it's part of medical culture that physicians need for themselves to have a high, to high level of, of, of confidence or certainty in their judgments. But of course, the other thing that's often said is that, well, whatever, they, whatever you as a physician think, uh, uh, think about the case, you can't afford to ever let on to the patient that you're uncertain, because, because it's the patients who really need, need certainty. So I, I think there, there are kind of two, kind of two, two, two dimensions. It, it, it may be that, that both physicians and their patients need to be more kind of grown up about um, the fact that actually this is very, in many cases, very uncertain. And there's a big element of, 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 of doubt, which needs to be much more frankly acknowledged. And it would be easier for the physicians to acknowledge it if they weren't then going to get jumped on by their patients who think, well, if you don't know the answer, I'm going to go to someone else. 
I'm a bit scared to um, ask you anything, otherwise you might all decide that I'm viciously overconfident. <laughs> and, um, but I wanted to ask um, two questions. I, just to follow on from that, I don't yeah. think patients are very upset by you when you share uncertainty with them. If, you, if, they, if you've done other things that are, if you kind of like dither around, they're not going to be at all happy on you. But if you're clear that you're unconfident for these reasons, yeah. I think patients like it. But the two points I wanted to make with you is we just talked about overconfidence, but there's also an underconfidence, an issue around underconfidence. So if, if I can think of clinicians who are very underconfident and who just take hours for doing anything, and so you've then got people dying in the waiting room yeah. almost, and, and, you're, um, and you're also people are being sent off for hundreds of tests, which just find incidental omas, which if anyone doesn't know what that is, you know, like if you test a whole, they've done a whole lot of tests doing head scans of, of army recruits and then they're finding a significant number of masses in their heads that are never going to be anything but are now really terrifying that person. Mm. And, um, and I was just really thinking about to, when I was um, studying, when I was a junior doctor doing gynecology, this isn't diagnosis, but this is, there were two gynecologists and one of them, we used to call him scissor hands because he might have sort of been operating like this. We were forever resuscitating women. You basically open an abdomen and he's going to punch it something. He thought he was brilliant. And, um, <laughs> and we just got used to resuscitating women who had done something terrible to them. But the other one, was he was going to kill them because they were under anaesthetic for such a long time mm. for the smallest of operations. And so this is not a good idea either. And I couldn't decide, I mean, I wasn't going to have either of them touching me, but you know what I mean? Neither of them is a good idea. So that was one point about underconfidence. And the other thing I wanted to just raise with you is about, you've been talking about different error types, but I think there are some really important differences between different sorts of diagnoses. So certainly in general practice, lots of people are going to get better by themselves. So who cares whether the diagnosis is virus A, B, or C? It doesn't matter, does it? What matters is, have you considered the red flags? And so I've certainly made some great diagnoses, which were not the specific right diagnosis, but I knew that this person needs to go somewhere else and have whatever this is sorted out by someone with fancier tests than me. And that's a successful diagnosis yeah. in my view, if you see what I mean. And the other thing about diagnosis is that you're not just doing diagnosis in, isol in isolation, you're doing safety measures so that you then say to people, I think it's this, but if why happens, you need to go here and get something else done. So it doesn't matter if you haven't diagnosed them, if you've told them when it is they need to do something else, then you're okay, that's what it seems to me, anyway. So it, it seems to me that diagnosis is not a one-off situation. Yeah. Yeah, th thanks. So that, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. The the, the 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 thing that you just said about diagnosis, and that that that's just helpful. That seems right to me. Um, the point about un, un, underconfidence as well as overconfidence, I think that's also right and very important. So one thing that I'm, I mean, just reading this literature on the uh, on 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 diagnostic error, one thing that I find very mysterious about it is that. People who think of um, overconfidence as a kind of subpersonal cognitive bias say things which strike me as just plainly false, right? So they say things like, well, overconfidence is, 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 is just a part of human nature that we all, you know, we all have. Uh, now, that seems to me to be a rather odd claim to make. I mean, it seems to me that, there, of course, there are people who are, un, who are overconfident and whose overconfidence is dangerous. But, of course, there are also people who are highly underconfident and whose underconfidence is also, da is also, is also, is also dangerous. Um, now, that doesn't fit at all the idea of some uni completely universal tendency to be overconfident that we all have uh, and over which, for which no one is therefore responsible because we all have it. It seems to me that once you, th once you think, look, there are people who are overconfident, there are people who are underconfident, and there are people whose levels of confidence are just right, if, if, if to put it crudely, there's something like th that you can draw a distinction along those lines, then it's hard not to think of overconfidence and underconfidence as, as personal qualities. It's hard to think of them as purely subpersonal, purely kind of mechanical cognitive, cognitive biases. Um, and I th so I, th I think... Uh, I mean, I, I, th I, think that I think you're right, and I, I, th I think that the, the, the significance of underconfidence just isn't recognized uh, in, in this literature, and, and it, 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 clearly, it clearly needs to be. And it's not just, you know, I, I, I certainly know clinicians who are very underconfident about one thing that they once got wrong, and they then see it everywhere, yeah. and, um, and it ruins the whole system. Yeah. And, um, and to continue giving an example from when I was doing gynecology, they used to say there is a 
Dr. Y coming in, and that was good that she had obviously missed a, a, an ectopic pregnancy, and so she would just say, any woman at all, for as a query ectopic pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. And then unfortunately, one of her women actually did have an ectopic pregnancy, and we were not very rapid with her, because we were like, oh, she had another one of her ones there, and this one really did have it. And so, you know, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and certainly, I, when I, whenever I've missed the diagnosis, you then worry, you know, you then think about it, and you cannot, you're not going to stop thinking about it. So this does affect your, your um, what you do later on. So it's not as though there may be a bell curve of under and overconfident, but yeah. there's going to be some bits where this particular thing I'm going to remain underconfident about. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that. that way, yeah. So, so, um, make it, can I introduce Aristotle into this? So, so, Ar so Aristotle says something which I think has a has a bearing on this, right? So, so all this talk about virtues and vices, it, it, it's basically very Aristotelian, right? So, so, so Aristotle had this idea that um, um, that uh, that Vices are extremes. Okay, so 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 so, so take um, cowardice, bravery, and recklessness. Okay, so, so 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 recklessness is a vice, which consists in being, as it were, excessively <laughs> in excess of what of bravery. Cowardice, which is not enough of it, and bravery is just <laughs> is just right. Okay. Similarly, if you think about intellectual vices and intellectual so-called virtues, okay, so you might have um, closed-mindedness, open-mindedness, and gullibility, right, so you might think, so gullibility is someone who's, someone who's gullible is, as it were, excessively open-minded, and then there's closed-mindedness, and, 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 and the virtue is, is the mean, is, the, is, is in between those two extremes. Okay, so in, in, so in the case of overconfidence, okay, so, so it's a bit like that, I mean, so you've got these extreme extremes on both sides, overconfidence and underconfidence, and then you have uh, the virtue, uh, which, which, is, which you might call, I don't know what, I mean, humility, modesty, some, some, something like that, something that recognizes that, that you, know, you might be wrong, but, that doesn't, but isn't paralyzed by the fear of being wrong. So if you're thinking about medical, medical training, medical education, I mean, what, what should we be trying to, as, as it were, inculcate in medical students, I mean, it's it, it's the virtuous mean. <laughs> in all of these cases, you don't want them to be, you know, gung ho, but you don't want them to be terrified either, right? Because either either way, it's deeply problematic. And it does vary with the with the patients because sometimes you actually need to they, they they want you to be confident. Yeah, yeah. And that's helpful for them. And of course, you still have to safety net them and say, well, that's what I think. I yeah. feel really very sure about yeah. that, but I'm not right all the time, yeah. and this is what you need to do if I'm not right. And so, and, but some people need more of that, they need kind of like a little bit more hand-holding, and that flexibility is what I think is really important, because some people don't need that at all. So yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's a very interesting issue here, which I, I don't know if there's any, been, been any research done on this, this whole question of what it is that patients want, or what they expect, or what they're happy with. You know, so I mean, in, in a way, you might think the idea that you know you need to you need to kind of exude complete confidence in your judgments. I mean, in a way, you might think that's very patronising, right? Because surely patients are adults. I mean, surely they can understand that sometimes it isn't that clear. On the other hand, I, I mean, you know, um, you might you, you know you might think that well, actually, there are some patients who really who really will find it difficult. Um, to accept that you know this this is a, this is an area of genuine doubt. So I, I don't know if this has ever been looked into. Just just what you know what patient expectations are of their of their of their doctors in terms of you know the level the level of the level of confidence in that, that that's that's portrayed. Um, if I could comment, follows on very much from from this discussion, um, and we seem to have reached quite a good consensus point. But in a way, we shouldn't have had to spend all that time getting there. And I don't know whether it's because of your, um, your definition of diagnostic error. That you say there's, there's one, that's just one species of medical error. Yeah. But are you saying there's only one kind of diagnostic error? And no. that's missing a diagnosis? No, no. Because that's cle clearly yeah, wrong. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a, type, there's a typo or a series of yeah, typos yeah. here. I mean, it, it's, it's, you it's a... the error twice. Yeah, it should, um, so, so um, I think that the, 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 the definition 
um, talks about delayed diagnoses, misdiagnoses, and various other kinds of. So, 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 the suggest, so, so, so what I was suggesting was not that 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 there's only one type of diagnostic error. The, 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 I, so the overall picture is that so there are errors. There's a generic category of human error, some of which are medical errors, some of which are diagnostic errors. And then, and then there, are, there are different types of diagnostic error. And of course, it's not, there are medical errors that aren't diagnostic errors, right? Um, so, so, uh, um, so I think if one wanted to tell a kind of detailed story here, to, to, flesh, to flesh this account out, then one way of fleshing it out, picking up on what you were saying and I think what other people have suggested, would, would be to, 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 to have a, a kind of subdivision of diagnostic errors or types of diagnostic error and to look at the, over, the, the plausibility of the overconfidence hypothesis in relation to different varieties of diagnostic error. Now that would involve a kind of fineness of grain that, that so far, that doesn't as far as I know, just doesn't exist I in the that's literature. that's overcomplicating it. There, there's really only two kinds of error. There's the error of omission and the error of commission. There's a false negative and there's a false positive. And the diagnostic error that you're talking about is the false negative. So. Uh, so the doctor was confident you were fine and missed some terrible illness. And of course what we're hearing is in fact much more endemic in medicine mm. is, the, is the precise op mm. opposite. It's the overdiagnosis. And, and it, I would say the problem in medicine is the undue weighting of the misdiagnosis. So you at the expense of overdiagnosis, many times over. It, it, it's like saying, it's the same as saying, we, we, we'd rather um, allow many guilty people to go free yeah. and to imprison one innocent man or woman. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so what, what, uh, I think I, 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 I'm broadly in agreement with you. I mean, I, it seems to me that I wouldn't want to restrict diagnostic error to just to, to false false negatives, I don't see why false positives couldn't, w wouldn't count as diagnostic errors. No, they're, they're, the two they're, the two, they're the two kinds. I think it's absolutely true that there's a huge emphasis on um, what you might call over-diagnosis, over, over over-testing, uh, and, and, it, 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 and if you're trying to explain why, why, why that is, I mean, that's a very complex phenomenon, which has not, it's not just to do with you know, with the epistemic vices of medical practitioners, it has a hell of a lot to do with things like, you know, worrying about litigation. <laughs> Right. So, 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 I mean, of course, it's absolutely right. And, and this is r really what, why I started out by saying that, you know, it, it's absurd to think about this topic in terms of a single magic bullet that's going to explain all of it. I mean, you know, di di over, over diagnosis, under diagnosis, whatever one wants, these are highly complex phenomena which have a whole lot of different explanations, you know, cultural, institutional, individual, you know, I mean, there's a whole mass of different things that are going on. And, 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 you know, the overconfidence, you know, the literature on overconfidence, it, it seems to me, I mean, I'm interested in it because I'm interested as a philosopher in epistemic vices, um, much more than I am in, in, you know, diagnostic error if for, it, for its own sake. But if, if one were really serious about giving a theory of diagnostic error, then of course one would need to look at, you know, the whole range of explanations for, 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 for diagnostic error. And that was... The, part of my classification of, you know, personal, subpersonal, systemic, and situational. And then, you know, no doubt there are lots of other categories that, that you know, that you could introduce as well. question up there. So when you were describing right at the beginning of the question session, uh, one of the typical studies, you described it as focusing on calibration, so how uh, well calibrated are the, mm. the uh, physicians in terms of where they rate their probability of yeah. getting diagnosis yeah. right versus how uh, they get the diagnosis right. 
Um, and then in the setup, you were explaining very thoughtful reasons why that could lead you to change the rate of correct diagnosis because it would change various pathways. And I'm sure that's right. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, I would just, just out, of in, inter out of this interest, I wanted to focus on the calibration bit. So yeah. in principle, you could improve that without improving the diagnostic rate, and that could get worse without making the diagnostic yeah. rate yeah. worse. Yeah. Um, and there doesn't seem to be something bad about getting that wrong. Maybe it's epistemically better to be well calibrated. But I wonder if you can speak specifically to that. What, why is it pernicious, other than its effect on diagnostic accuracy, to be epistemically badly calibrated? Uh, I, I think that that is the only reason why it's supposed to be pernicious. I don't think any, any, any at least as far as as far as what I was saying today was concerned, no, nothing else was being offered. For so I, I thought when we were getting into the effect on patients, there yeah. is something there that's about yeah. the interaction that is pernicious. Yeah. So yeah. If, if a doctor, without affecting their, you know, without mm. making it the many worse, and how it might be able to get it right, nevertheless signals a higher confidence than they mm. have that mm. might affect decisions that the patient makes, yeah. so they're not yeah. making their decisions yeah. in their own best interest because yeah. the wrong probability in that yeah, well, that, I mean, that, 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 that's a suggestion that I, that I was, was, was gesturing at in the q and it's not, it's not a suggestion for, for which I have any empirical uh, evidence at all, which is why I didn't want to make anything of it here. But I, I, mean, I, I mean, the reality is that if you're thinking of um, overconfidence in the way that these folks are thinking about it, so, so they have this overconfidence in terms of you know, miscalibration, but of course, they relate it to more general uh, personal qualities, you know, like arrogance and complacency. Now, of course, if you're thinking about those traits, uh, I mean, why are they pernicious? They aren't just pernicious because they, because they result in miscalibration. And, and, I mean, they, 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 they're pernicious, if, if they are, for all sorts of other reasons, too, to do with your relationship with your colleagues, your relationship with uh, people working under you, your relationship with your patients. So, so, so the effects may be, may be pernicious in a whole lot of different in a whole lot of different ways, uh, and that that's, that's I mean I think that's true of epistemic vices, you know, in, in, in general. So um, I wasn't saying what I was saying in in order to kind of restrict the um, effects of these uh, of closed-mindedness just just to this very narrow consideration. Uh, of miscalibration, but it, 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 as, as far as the studies are concerned, that's what the evidence, that, that's what's been looked into. About the intrinsic value of calibration, there are results of, um, that uh, show, if you've, if you've ever heard of Dutch book arguments or arguments that you should follow the axioms of probability, um, lest you have a sure loss, the same thing is true if you're uh, miscalibrated then you are, are, are vulnerable to sure loss, so that's a reason to be calibrated. But anyway, um, Garrett. Thank you. Um, Gareth Owen from the Institute of Psychiatry, King's. Um, your, the way you're analyzing um, epistemic vices sounds, seems very helpful. And I was wondered, I wondered listening to you how constrained you are by limiting the analysis of them to individual psychology or, or to what extent you can bring them <coughs> to groups. And that perhaps is one of some of the issues that came up earlier about practices of over-diagnosis yeah. within certain cultures. Yeah. Another relevant very factor here is the extension of the diagnostic category, uh, which can arise, for example, as a consequence of specialization of diagnostic yeah. practices within medicine. So really yeah. a question about to what extent can you extend your idea of epistemic devices? Yeah. To, um, well, thanks. I mean, I, um, so, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm currently write, I'm writing a book on epistemic vices, right? And, and, and the starting point is, is very much in individual vices. But to, towards the end, I, look, I, I talk about um, what I call um, institutional vices, institutional epistemic vices. Okay, so, so the thought would be that, that it's not just individuals who have, who display these vices, but in, in, institutions qua institutions. Um, so if you think about um, terms that we apply to, you know, companies or uh, health systems or, or, or governments, um, uh, a lot of these vice terms that I've been using are vice terms that we also employ it, at, at the institutional or organizational level. Um, so, I, so I'm not at all building into my definition of an epistemic vice that, there, uh, that 
only individuals can have them. And I, and I, and I mean, I, I think what you are suggesting sounds you know, extremely, extremely plausible, right? That, that if you think about um, uh, the way that professions work or the way that uh, organizations work, I mean, there may, be, there may be vices that they display that are um, analogous to vices that individuals display, but maybe there are vices that organizations or institutions have that are, are, are specific to them. You know, so over you know, over specialization, for example, you might think is. I mean, it's a bit. I mean, it's a bit odd. Well, I mean, you might say that an individual has, has the vice of over specialization, but I think it's it's much more pertinent to think about that as as, as a vice that 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 manifests at the level of you know s s systems. So, so in answer to your question, no, I, I, I'm not restricting epistemic vices to individuals. Uh, that's just the starting point for my discussion. I think there are epistemic vices that apply at a systemic level as well. And I think a complete story about epistemic vices would, would certainly need to look at um, the relationship between individual epistemic vices and systemic vices. Hi, so I'll try and state my question, but then sort of give some background to why I'm asking it. So you've said kind of quite negatively that maybe um, the epistemic vices are something that even knowing about it isn't going to change anything. The kind of question is whether you can increase people's motivation to self-examine and self-reflect and whether that can have an effect. And the reason why I think about the mood, my background is I'm doing a PhD in personality disorders, which is a very complex kind of different for diagnosis and there's a lot of stigma about it um, and research has shown that um, doctors often don't disclose the diagnosis, one of the reasons being they're worried about stigma and what I'm thinking is but when, the, when you don't tell service users that diagnosis you're also undermining their autonomy and there are real effects such as if their personality disorder has an effect on their ability to work but it's not written down and told to them that can actually prevent them from accessing benefits and so on. And if you could, you, you could potentially motivate clinicians to self-examine by pointing out that there are moral implications of how they diagnose. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, so, I, so I don't, I, 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 I wouldn't want to rule out the, the, po the possibility of motivating people to engage in self-examination. Uh, what, what, what I was suggesting, however, was that um, you may be more likely to succeed with people who need it less than the people who need it more. I mean, the th so the thought is that you know, if you're presented with someone who is, um, le leave aside doctors, right, but just in, in, in general, I mean, someone who's, you know, excessively confident in themselves, so somewhat complacent, doesn't really have a sense of, you know, their own, their own fallibility and their own errors, I mean, motivating them to engage in self, to engage in self-examination, it sounds like it's going to be a much harder task than motivating someone who doesn't have those epistemic vices. So, so the, the, the suggestion was not that it's not po that that you know you can't motivate people to engage in self-examination, but rather that it may be difficult to motivate self-examination in those who, as it were, need it the most. Um, I don't. I mean, that's 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 just a suggestion, right? I mean, I don't have any evidence for that. It's to, it, uh, but but thinking about the notion of a stealthy vice, it, it seems to me to have some plausibility anyway. On that question of stealthy vices and what to do about that in particular, um, you mentioned, and it seems plausible that um, doctors are able to recognize faults in other doctors. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, is could you imagine a system where? Um, one would have to receive feedback from other doctors yeah. about it. So they could each point to, to the other one and maybe that feedback would make a difference. Yeah, I think, it, I think in, in, in practical terms that's the, that's, that's, the, I, that's the best idea that I think you know, people have come up with. So, so one of the things that people say is that in the literature is that, is that you know, the, the levels of overconfidence that you find are partly a reflection of the absence of adequate feedback. Uh, that, 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 you know, it's because they don't, you know, they don't have any external, um, external indication of, of how, how, how much they're going wrong and why they're going wrong, that they're able to just blithely assume that everything is all right. So that might, that might, I mean, that might be a practical, that might be a practical, um, a practical step. 
Uh, but I can, I, I mean, I, if you think about how you would implement such a system of feedback, you can think of all sorts of practical problems that would, uh, that would, that, you know, that, that would arise. Um, I mean, there's also, a, a, you know, d just a, a general, a much more general psychological uh, point that's often been pointed out, which is that, you know, uh, in, in, in general, if it's a matter of um, o uh, overcoming uh, self-ignorance by, uh, you know, talking to other people, the problem is that very often uh, you interpret what other people say in a way that's favorable to you. Right? So it's not always or the... the opposite uh, if you're the so it's once again... Oh, yeah, yeah, so this is, a, this, this is just an example of how these... I mean, the problem is that these vices play themselves out, not just, I mean, not just in the first order practice, they play themselves out also in whatever, whatever strategies have been devised to overcome the first order problems.